you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and, and thank you to all of you for uh, very kindly, uh, for, to the Institute for inviting me, first of all, and I apologize that on two occasions, indeed, I had to uh, cancel because of these uh, visits or, or meetings. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to meet many uh, friends from uh, my, uh, all my past life uh, in the EU, uh, before the EU, uh, and uh, so I will try to um, give you uh, my uh, assessment, often personal assessment, of uh, what I believe to be uh, a quite a difficult situation still in the Balkans. Uh, I was looking at my notes uh, of the first time I spoke here uh, about the Balkans uh, a few months after I had taken up my post as EU Special Representative and Head of Delegation. It was the first time ever in the EU uh, institutional uh, mechanism uh, in uh, its foreign policy action that it had appointed someone who would represent both the Council and the Commission. And the idea was to try to give a much more uh, coordinated uh, message of the European Union out in the field, because at that time in several countries of the Balkans we had many different actors not always speaking to the same or not always singing to the same uh, song sheet. And uh, so this was, I was an experiment when I was appointed in November 2005 to try to bring together all the different mechanisms of the European Union uh, and uh, thus to try to give a stronger impact of the EU message out in the field. In fact, uh, it was a precursor of the Lisbon Treaty, because now the Lisbon Treaty uh, is, uh, uh, provides for the representation of the EU in a fully comprehensive manner, as I had done since 2005. And I'm happy that uh, the experiment um, worked, uh, at least at my very modest level, uh, because uh, I am still standing here before you. I've gone almost completely bald. But uh, nevertheless, I believe that uh, the Lisbon mechanism, at least from the point of view of strengthening the role of the EU out in the field, uh, is a very sensible one. It uh, gives a much greater uh, cohesion uh, to the EU messages and much stronger impact and it prevents uh, host countries from trying to play one institution against the other which was sometimes the case uh, uh, between the the council uh, mechanisms the commission and uh, all of that so um, there are still of course these what you might call uh, turf battles uh, in Brussels but I think that gradually uh, they are being left aside for uh, the greater necessity of uh, having a very strong uh, foreign policy of the EU out in the field. And uh, when I looked at my notes, uh, my assessment of the situation uh, in, um, I guess I can say, <coughs> Macedonia, I know that officially um, the uh, European Union still has to use the temporary um, a title, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Uh, and uh, so, um, but if I have to repeat that each, each time, it may take rather long. Yeah. So I hope you will, I apologize to the EU institutions. We, we have a footnote uh, that we put on uh, a lot okay. of stuff that we write, which is complicated about the Republic of Macedonia and the former Yugoslavia and so on. So call it Macedonia and we risk it. So, uh, because there in 2005, it was just uh, basically when uh, the candidate status was granted uh, to the country. And this was a recognition of the great efforts that had been made uh, by the uh, political leaders to overcome the divisions of the past. You will recall that in 2001, there was a conflict that uh, almost tore the country apart with over uh, 200 people uh, killed. Uh, and. Uh, it ended uh, largely uh, thanks to uh, international uh, intervention, the European Union uh, together with NATO and the OSCE, uh, and uh, which resulted in the signing of the Ohrid Framework Agreement in August 2001. And now, of course, we, were, we are approaching the 10th anniversary of that uh, agreement. And um, the role of the EU 
has always been and remains vital together with the OSCE and NATO because we are guarantors of that awkward framework agreement. So there is a legal obligation of the European Union to ensure full implementation. Um, and um, so this decision to grant Canada status was also an encouragement to the country to continue uh, with the much needed reforms. Uh, and I think it's a, a, uh, an important lesson as regards the EU policy towards the Balkans, that when there are uh, sufficient uh, incentives, uh, when uh, rewards are very clearly marked, uh, the reform process is given a greater uh, impetus. Uh, and uh, we saw that uh, also with regard to the visa liberalization. Uh, which was an important uh, decision of the EU to uh, facilitate travel from the Balkan countries uh, at a time when there was many, many restrictions. Students, professors, journalists who wanted tra to travel to the EU had to go through a very complicated and even humiliating experience uh, of applying for visas, bringing bank accounts and so on. All that, fortunately, is over, but of course to achieve that we had set out a whole roadmap of reforms that the Balkan countries had to fulfill, and they successfully fulfilled it. Uh, so the reward was there. And similarly with the uh, EU uh, integration process, uh, and the perspective of the European Union still remains the glue that uh, keeps the countries uh, together, uh, multi-ethnic societies, <coughs> like uh, in the country where I was for five years, uh, and also countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and uh, the others. So the EU perspective uh, is really uh, the mechanism that ensures that uh, the, uh, the value of the reform process is uh, uh, this uh, end result of full membership of the European Union. However, that said, um, one should never uh, take for granted uh, the situation in the Balkans, and nothing is irreversible. This is something that I have learned with uh, difficult experience over the nine years that I have been working in the Balkans now. First in Slovenia, as you recalled, a success, a success story uh, very much because uh, it went through the difficult reform process and became a full member in 2004 and has already assumed the presidency, it has the euro, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, for the other countries, uh, it's certainly a much more uh, difficult challenge. And in uh, the case that I have been most familiar with over the last years, there has been uh, a, a backsliding in a number of areas, and I'll explain that uh, in, in more uh, detail. So it's very important, and that's why I really appreciate that the Balkan group is still active in the Institute. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in London meeting with the uh, chairperson of the House of Lords EU Affairs Committee, which also has been producing uh, regular reports on the Balkans. Uh, and of course, the European Parliament uh, keeps a regular focus and other, some other countries. But this focus on the Balkans is of vital importance in order to ensure that all the member countries maintain this priority of uh, EU integration perspective for all the countries of the Balkans, no matter how long it takes. Because whenever there is a danger of wavering or whenever the countries of the Balkans see that there is uh, a certain wavering in the commitment of the EU, a very often a misinterpretation of uh, statements made by political leaders of the EU for domestic audiences. Uh, this is used by nationalist forces to say, well, uh, the EU is not uh, interested <coughs> anymore in uh, our accession, and therefore, uh, why are we doing these painful reforms? And of course, our uh, strongest argument uh, is not just the issue of uh, integration at the end of these painful reforms, but also that these painful reforms are necessary even if the EU weren't there. These are reforms which have been tested uh, over the, the, the years with the previous enlargements, 
and are vital for any society coming out of a, a conflict situation or from a former uh, uh, planned system like, like the old uh, Yugoslavia. So uh, this EU commitment uh, is, uh, remains uh, particularly important for uh, ensuring that the countries of the Balkan region continue on the reform process. If you look at the, uh, the uh, process over the past years and the record of individual countries, it varies considerably. Croatia is now on the threshold of completing the negotiations and hopefully uh, we uh, hope to see them finished during the course of this year, uh, an accession perhaps 2013 or something like that. But anyway, that's, that's a foregone. Uh, for the other countries, uh, it's certainly more difficult, although we have seen good progress as regards Serbia and Montenegro. Uh, and this is very much due uh, to uh, strong action by the personalities involved, if you take Serbia. The role of Boris Tadic, president, has been a remarkable uh, for a country that uh, saw so much division and conflict uh, in, its, uh, in the past decade or more. And we recall uh, the very courageous act of uh, President Tadic, who was the first Serb to go to Srebrenica to ask for apology for the terrible tragedy uh, of Srebrenica with so many thousands killed. And that was required tremendous courage uh, from uh, a, a leader in the Balkans. Last year, he went to Vukovar uh, in Croatia, another example. And if you read his speech uh, at the UN General Assembly, the last UN General Assembly in September, it's probably one of the best speeches on reconciliation in the Balkans that certainly I have heard uh, for quite some time. I mentioned that because uh, I firmly believe that uh, long-lasting stability in the Balkans will not be possible without a, a strong reconciliation process, similar, for example, to the South African experience, which a number of us here were uh, fortunate to, to witness uh, the reconciliation process uh, there. So this year it may see some quite significant, um, some quite significant uh, developments with regard to uh, Serbia, to Montenegro. Um, Kosovo, of course, is still in a very difficult situation because there are five countries that still do not uh, officially recognize the, the status. But still, we are managing to overcome this status issue by involving Kosovo as much as possible in the various uh, activities and reform processes. And there is, as you know, a, an informal dialogue uh, ongoing between uh, Serbia and Kosovo uh, leadership to try to bring uh, the countries forward. And there, the EU uh, intervention last September with the UN resolution on Serbia and Kosovo was particularly uh, important, uh, positive, development. Albania has been through a difficult political uh, situation, boycotting of parliament uh, and uh, unrest uh, and uh, things are moving gradually but still uh, a lot of difficulties. And then uh, when we look at uh, the uh, situation in uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, there I have to say that uh, it has been uh, a, a very, very difficult situation. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, we were uh, witnessing a very positive atmosphere uh, after the candidate status, and there was general feeling that we would actually might even be able to conceive of uh, negotiations, a date set for negotiations within a year or so. But then with the elections uh, of the uh, current uh, Prime Minister uh, Goreski in July 2006, the situation changed quite dramatically. Uh, and uh, many wounds that we thought healed by the awkward framework agreement were reopened. The issue of political dialogue uh, rose to the surface again. Uh, and the old uh, bad habits of the Balkans 
uh, appeared, uh, and that's why, again, I, I, I underline that nothing is irreversible uh, in uh, the Balkans. So during 2007, 2008, very difficult situation, no political dialogue, elections in 2008 where we had violence, one killed, 10 injured, many irregularities, and there were elections that were deemed not to be democratic or to fulfill the international standards by the uh, observation, international observation mission of the uh, OSCE. Uh, 2009 was uh, a much better year uh, from every point of view. Uh, and because we saw a much more consistent uh, reform effort uh, by uh, the country, uh, because the perspective, it was uh, the, we're approaching the end of the Commission's mandate, and Commissioner Rehn was keen to leave his mark uh, on the enlargement uh, strategy of the EU, and it was made very clear to uh, the Macedonian government that if they fulfilled all the reforms, they could uh, uh, be uh, rewarded with uh, a recommendation that a date be set for opening negotiations. And this is actually what happened. Uh, the reform process continued. Uh, okay, there were some areas where uh, it was uh, you know, not perfect, but nevertheless, there was a feeling that the uh, commitment was there. Uh, and uh, so uh, the commission uh, recommended in October 2009 that now the time had come uh, that a date be set for opening negotiations with the country. And this recommendation was accompanied by a plea from the commissioner uh, to the country's government to resolve the name <coughs> issue once and for all with its neighbor. Because the prime minister had said, actually, that if he is given an unconditional recommendation, he will ensure that he devotes all his efforts to the uh, solving the name issue. And the first meeting between both prime ministers took place actually two weeks after that, on the end of October 2009. And it was followed during the course of 2010 by seven other bilateral meetings. But we still have no solution in sight. And as is known, uh, until such time uh, as uh, the uh, name issue is resolved, the uh, recommendation that a date be set for, uh, for open negotiations is put on hold. In uh, last, the last progress report in November of 2010, the Commission reconfirmed its recommendation that a date be set, but it also added uh, concern uh, over the fact that uh, there needs to be much greater efforts for political dialogue uh, and uh, a greater effort to uh, to uh, address uh, issues such as intimidation of the media, such as intimidation of civil society, and very difficult uh, issues which uh, arose during 2010. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, this call for enhanced political dialogue was basically ignored uh, by the Prime Minister. Uh, and despite our pleas, uh, and in December, I recall hosting a lunch for the Prime Minister with all the ambassadors present. And again, we asked for political dialogue with all the leaders, but it didn't happen. And this year, you will have seen uh, the boycott of the Parliament, this old bad habit again, rising again by the opposition party. Uh, and for me, uh, this boycott in this particular case is not the cause of the deep political malaise in the country. It's a symptom of the malaise. Malaise which grew because of the failure to focus on regular political dialogue and consultation uh, on all the issues facing uh, the country. So now we have early elections. The elections were due to take place in 2012. Now we will have parliament will be dissolved probably tomorrow, and early elections will take place on the 5th of June. I, my last plea before I left, uh, because already at that time, at the end of February, I, I left uh, the country on 28th of February, uh, the prospect of early elections was almost inevitable, and my last plea to the government was to please make sure that the political environment is less charged uh, than it is currently, and certainly less than what happened in 2008 
because uh, the election of 2008 uh, and the irregularities there were very much due to the failure to create a, a positive environment conducive to elections free from intimidation. Uh, I did mention that in 2009, uh, the uh, presidential local elections took place, which helped to restore the democratic credentials of the country. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, International Observation Mission did point out that although the elections met most of the international standards, there were serious concerns of many allegations of intimidation, particularly directed at public service employees, basically government saying, to the public service employees, if you don't vote for us, for the government, you may lose your job or your family and so on, and many, many documented cases in this. So the main characteristics of the current situation are lack of political dialogue, and this is a constant problem, uh, and I guess it has also to do with the concept of power, that a government which controls uh, the majority in parliament, which controls two-thirds of the municipalities, which controls uh, the president, because the president is, uh, was a candidate from the political party and has not yet established a, an independent profile, although he is trying very hard to, to promote a, a, a spirit of, of unity. But um, a failure to uh, reach out to the opposition, to engage with the opposition in trying to resolve some of the issues and basically steamrolling policies and actions and projects through the parliament without proper consultation. Another characteristic is the very confrontational political atmosphere I, I mentioned. If you put on the TV uh, every day, it's a constant exchange of insults between the political parties. and it's not the sort of general political insults that one might be used to in some of our own countries. It's much worse than that. It's very nasty, it's very personalized, and it's questioning the integrity of, of individuals. And this uh, is done mainly through the media, uh, and also it's directed at civil society and at the media as well. And if you look at the last progress report, is clearly mentioned, the concern over intimidation uh, of the media. And it's also even against the diplomatic community. Uh, criticisms by uh, government uh, party, government ministers or party members against the diplomatic community, uh, several ambassadors to such an extent mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we had to ask the dean of the diplomatic corps to make a formal démarche uh, to the foreign minister uh, with, uh, on these issues to ask for, to remind them that diplomatic community is there to help the country, uh, to assist, uh, and should uh, the basic principles of the uh, Vienna Convention should be, uh, should be respected. Another important characteristic is the increased uh, tension between the different ethnic communities. This is reflected uh, in several areas, but I will mention two. Uh, one is the education. There, uh, there has been an increasing trend of segregation on linguistic lines in <coughs> secondary schools. The whole idea of the awkward framework agreement was to promote an integrated, uh, multi-ethnic society uh, at every level. Uh, and, but what has been emerging uh, is uh, uh, teaching done basically on linguistic lines so the ethnic Albanians uh, are taught one side and the ethnic Macedonians on the other side, and no linking between the two, so you don't create this uh, atmosphere of multi-ethnic society. So to such an extent that the High Commissioner for National Minorities, Ambassador Volobek, uh, for several years now has been following this and devised with the, uh, with the uh, input of the government an integrated education strategy, which was formally adopted by the government in October of last year. But despite that, we still have this continuing uh, trend uh, of, uh, of uh, separate uh, teaching, uh, and this creates uh, the mistrust. The second example is on the census. We've all gone, all going through the census, um, and uh, in all the Balkan countries, it was scheduled for the spring. 
uh, for April now. Uh, and uh, in a number of countries it has been postponed, including in the Macedonian case because of the elections. But uh, we were heavily involved in the preparation for the census uh, with the Eurostat uh, uh, contributing expertise. And of course, in the Macedonian case, it's particularly sensitive because many rights under the Oakland Framework Agreement accrue on the basis of the percentage of an ethnic community. So if the Albanian ethnic Albanian community comprises over 20% of population given area, then Albanian becomes an official language of that area. So this is why uh, the preparation of the census was so difficult and sensitive, again reflecting a lack of trust between the ethnic communities. And there, the government was very open and, and did try to take on board as much as possible many of the suggestions of the Eurostat, but now, of course, it is postponed. And then, of course, there are the religious tensions. This was a fault line which never existed uh, in the Macedonian situation. Even in 2001, uh, you had a very strong coordination between the Muslim Orthodox Catholic uh, communities. But because of a number of actions by the government, not least the launching of this so-called Skopje 2014 urban renewal plan, which was very much a mono-ethnic uh, urban renewal plan, providing for an Orthodox church in the center of what is a, the capital city of a multi-ethnic society. This caused immediate uh, concern and reaction from the Muslim community. So these tensions have been more or less dealt with, but again, uh, are very, very close to the surface. And again, it demonstrates a lack of consultation and a greater need for sensitivity on the part of uh, the government uh, and the, uh, all the political leaders, uh, because they're all involved, uh, in all issues relating to uh, ethnic, uh, cultural identity, uh, etc. And then, of course, we have the economic situation, which still remains very serious. 31% unemployment is the official figure. Over 30% of the population living below the poverty line. Uh, and uh, uh, foreign investment, the lowest on average uh, in the region. The government have made a lot of efforts to attract foreign investment. But the message that we have conveyed to them is that until there is a level playing field, until there is a, a clear regulatory environment, uh, until uh, uh, corruption practices have been eliminated in the public tendering, it will be very difficult to see uh, foreign investment uh, increasing. So this is why uh, with our EU assistance, which now reaches almost 100 billion euros a year, we have been trying to help them uh, in uh, the reform process. So <clears throat> what are the main challenges facing uh, the country now? Uh, well, certainly it is trying to maintain the momentum on uh, the reform process. This is a very real uh, issue because even President Barroso, who was in uh, Ohrid uh, on his official visit to the country last Saturday, uh, st said in his public statement, the EU should take center stage in your political debate, thus emphasizing that uh, the priority given to the European Union had certainly slid considerably down the uh, list of priorities uh, largely due to the uh, government. And uh, this is also um, linked perhaps to the whole issue of um, the uh, uh, public support for EU and NATO, which remains very, very strong, but also uh, the fact that uh, there are uh, public opinion at least, a lot nurtured by the government, who are against changing the name in order to uh, try to uh, achieve the objective of EU-NATO integration. So it is very difficult to conceive uh, of a, a compromise at the moment if public opinion is not being prepared for a compromise. Uh, and this is an important, uh, and I've often used the example of uh, Northern Ireland uh, and where we had to change our constitution, etc. We had a referendum, we prepared public opinion. And uh, many, many times have I used this to try to convince 
the government that uh, the political reality is being what it is, a compromise is necessary, and it is important to prepare public opinion uh, for uh, this compromise, but we still have not yet reached that stage. Another important challenge is effective implementation of the laws. Laws are adopted, but not sufficient financial or human resources to implement them. So they're there uh, as uh, ticking off a list, if you like, a box on the list, but no effective implementation, and this still remains a, a continuing uh, weakness. This year uh, could be a vital year, and uh, Commissioner Fühle mentioned it uh, when Prime Minister Gresky was in Brussels two weeks ago uh, on his last visit, that uh, 2011 offers a unique opportunity for the country. 10th anniversary of the awkward framework agreement, 20th anniversary of their independence. Therefore, opportunities to promote a unified approach on the major issues facing the agenda of the country. Uh, but with elections now taking place, early elections, uh, attention has been diverted from all of this. So by the time the elections are over, we hope without irregularities, by the time a government is formed, we're already into the summer uh, and uh, it will be uh, difficult to catch up uh, on the time lost. There have been some suggestions on how to keep the reform uh, momentum going uh, by, for example, uh, the um, a Council, European Council of Foreign Relations, that the screening process should be initiated. Uh, the screening process is a, a process which starts once official negotiations begin with each country, country, and basically it is a checking of all the legislation in those countries to see if they conform fully with the EU legislation. And this could perhaps give a certain momentum or at least keep the momentum going mm -hmm. on the reforms, because this is the big challenge, how to ensure that the country remains committed to these reforms that are vital uh, for the country's future, even without the European Union. And the final point I would make is regards the European Parliament. They are assuming an increasingly important role in uh, EU uh, policies, no, including EU uh, foreign policy. Uh, they just last week adopted a resolution on uh, Macedonia, uh, and it sets out very clearly uh, the positive aspects and the not so positive aspects. Uh, and I really believe that the European Parliament needs to play perhaps a more important role, particularly looking at the political families. For example, Prime Minister Gorecki, his party is a member of the EPP, European People's Party. Uh, and um, there are some, of course, in the European People's Party who will make statements that are very positive, and we all want to be positive but without, uh, without um, underlining those areas where reforms are still necessary. This resolution of the Parliament is a very balanced one because it precisely sets out those. And I believe that uh, the political families of these countries need to pay more attention how they can help in political dialogue, in promoting a stronger political culture of consultation and so on rather than just playing lip service because of political affiliations. So I will end there. I'm sorry I've been far longer than I anticipated, but I'd be delighted to answer any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.